Good morning, everyone, and welcome. My name is Richard Maud. I'm the director of the 2020 ANU Crawford Leadership Forum. And today I'm joining you from Canberra, which is on the traditional lands of the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people. And our Australian audience is joining us from many different parts of the country. So today we acknowledge and celebrate the first Australians on whose land we meet. And I pay my respects to elders past and present and I extend those respects to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander colleagues who may be joining us today. I'm really delighted that you could join us this morning for the first ever online ANU Crawford Leadership Forum. And we really hope in taking this program online that we've replicated the best qualities of the Leadership Forum, including our senior speakers and also our diverse invitation only audience spanning government business non-government organizations and the research and academic community i'm also really delighted this morning that the anu's chancellor julie bishop is joining us today i'm going to introduce julie in a minute but first a reminder that we also want to try and recreate the interactivity and intimacy that's also part of the leadership forum culture in other words, we encourage you to participate in this conversation and to ask questions. Now, here's how you can do that. There are two ways uh, that you can answer, uh, ask a question. First of all, you can enter your question into the Q&A box on your toolbar. And then if you want to ask the question yourself, if you then click on the raise hand button, uh, your name will then be read out by the chair. There's just going to be a delay of a couple of seconds while we enable your microphone and then you'll see that you can then turn on your camera and microphone yourself. And when you see yourself on screen, you can ask your question. If you don't want to appear on screen and you're happy for the chair of our conversation um, to ask your question, just type not live in front of the question. Uh, and if that all sounds a little complicated, don't worry, because these instructions uh, will be posted. Final point from me, this session is being broadcast on ANU TV, TV, and it is a public session. So look, now it's my great pleasure to introduce Julie Bishop, Chancellor of the Australian National University, to say a few words. Julie, over to you. Thank you, Richard, and good morning, everyone. I join you from the beautiful city of Perth, which is still behind closed borders in Western Australia on the traditional lands of the Noongar people and I pay my respects to elders past and present. Welcome to the digital version of the Australian National University Crawford Leadership Forum. And I'm delighted that this significant fixture on the ANU calendar has been able to adapt to the COVID world, the new normal of online meetings, otherwise known as Zoomland. I think it's as important as ever for a dialogue such as this to continue. And I'm so pleased that we have a lineup of speakers quite outstanding to discuss some of the very difficult and complex challenges we face today, as well as the opportunities that may come from this unprecedented global pandemic and these uncertain times in which we live. Today's agenda has been divided into two. This morning, our panellists will look at the global economy and COVID. Uh, as we know, the pandemic has hit different countries at different stages and at different levels. And so it's early days to judge what's happening in the global economy. But governments around the world are spending enormous sums of money, driving up debt levels in order to support their economies and in particular support jobs. Tourism and international education will obviously be severely impacted and will they return to their pre-COVID levels? I'm sure our Reserve Bank Governor will have some thoughts on what we do about these increasing debt levels and what is a sustainable level of spending. Then this afternoon, we're turning to Australia and COVID-19. Where to from here? Again, state and federal governments have been putting in place extraordinary measures to deal with the impact of the restrictions that have been put in place to flatten the curve. 
And while the incidence of the infection here in Australia is relatively low, the economic impact will still be dramatic. So these and other fascinating and challenging questions will be contemplated today. I'm so pleased you could all join us and I'll now hand over to this morning's chair, Renee Fry McGibbon from the Crawford School of Public Policy. Over to you, Renee. Thank you, Julie. Uh, welcome, everybody. I'm Renee Fry McGibbon, Professor of Economics at the Crawford School of Public Policy at the ANU, and I'm co director of the COVID 19 and the Macroeconomy Research Program at the Centre for Applied Macroeconomic Analysis in the Crawford School. So we're excited to have you join us for our um, panel discussion today on the global economy and COVID-19. But let me also begin by acknowledging and celebrating the first Australians on whose many traditional lands we meet through Zoom today and pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging. So in this session, we have a distinguished panel of economists from US, Asia and Australia who are dealing with the economic issues that are arising from the evolution of COVID-19. So let me first begin by introducing our panellists. We have Catherine Mann, Yuping Huang, and Philip Lowe. So Catherine Mann is Managing Director and Chief uh, Global Chief Economist at CITI, where she is responsible for thought leadership, research guidance of a global team of economists, and cross-fertilisation of research across macroeconomics, fixed income, and equities. She was Chief Economist at the OECD, CD, Finance Deputy to the G20, the Barbara 54 and Richard M. Rosenberg Professor of Global Finance at Brandeis University and Director of the Rosenberg Institute of Global Finance. She has also held positions at the Peter G. Peterson Institute for International Economics, the Federal Reserve Board of Governors, the President's Council of Economic Advisors and advisor to the Chief Economist at the World Bank. Dr. Mann received her PhD in economics from the MIT and her undergraduate degree from Harvard University. Our second panelist is Yiping Wang, who is Director of the Institute of Digital Finance and Jin Guang Chair, Professor of Economics and Deputy Dean of the National School of Development at Peking University. He is a member of the Monetary Policy Committee at the People's Bank of China and Research Fellow at the Finance Research Centre of the Council's Office of the State Council. He serves as Chairman of the Academic Committee of China Finance 40 Forum, a member of Chinese Economist 50 Forum, and the Rio Tinto Adjunct Professor in the Chinese Economy at the ANU. He has also held positions at the, at the State Council, the ANU, Columbia Business School and Citigroup. Yuping received his PhD in economics from the ANU. Our third panellist is Philip Lowe, who is Governor of the Reserve Bank of Australia. Mr Lowe holds a PhD from MIT and a Bachelor of Commerce with Honours in Economics and Econometrics from the University of New South Wales. He has authored numerous papers, including on the linkages between monetary policy and financial stability. He's chair of the Reserve Bank Board and Payments System Board and chair of the Council of Financial Regulators and a member of the Financial Stability Board. He also held positions as Deputy Governor and Assistant Governor at the Reserve Bank. Mr Lowe is chair of the Financial Markets Foundation for Children and a director of the Annika Foundation. He is also a signatory to the Banking and Finance Oath. The full biographies of our speakers are available in the conference program. So while you're getting your questions together, remember to um, put them on the Q&A um, bar at the bottom of your screen. But while you're doing that, I will now ask some questions of our panelists. And we'd love to hear from you. So I'm going to start with Catherine. So I just let me begin, um, Catherine. So you're based in the US. Can you tell us what your experience of COVID has been in the last um, several months? Well, Renee, yes, I'm based in New York. That's uh, where the city's main offices are, 388 Greenwich Street in New York. But um, city no, is no longer there, really. There's nobody in the office there at all. Um, and when city were, went uh, quite actually precipitously to a work from home um, protocol in March, uh, middle of March, I actually moved to my uh, permanent residence up in New Hampshire. So, um, you know, from my standpoint, you know, I have a global team. Um, I'm used to working with that global team uh, on remote capabilities. Uh, we haven't used Zoom so much in the past, but of course we, we use it now. So for me, uh, moving from a, a New York office to a New Hampshire office was actually fairly seamless in terms of the work that I do and the team that I work with. Now, of course, clients are different in the sense that uh, now I'm, I'm meeting with clients on a remote basis instead of face-to-face uh, -face, uh, traveling around the world. Uh, but in some sense, uh, it's, a, it's a 
a, a, a vision of where we're going to go because city is, is not intending to have uh, people back into the office 100% until sometime next year. So uh, my apartment in New York, the lease went up and, and I didn't renew it. So I, I'm now uh, permanently a New Hampshire resident, at least until something else changes. So a little bit different than um, living in New York where some of my team members are there and it has been much, much more difficult for them than it has been for me. I'm very fortunate. Hmm. It will be interesting to see how uh, how consumers and, and businesses are going to change after this. But that sort of touches a little bit on your research. So your research at City focuses on interactions between uh, financial market decision making um, and real side consumer and business investment decision making, and you have a, a global perspective. Presumably, your research has taken on a new urgency, um, not just for City, but for for the global economy as well. So, can you share some of your insights from your experience on the reactions of consumers and businesses uh, on a global basis to COVID nineteen? And does this vary with the intensity of an economy's exposure to sectors such as um, technology, tourism, and commodities? So, we've been evaluating um, countries uh, within the global economy through the lens of different sectors. And uh, we've sort of euphemistically called these sectors work sectors and play sectors. Uh, now, the work sectors are more manufacturing oriented, ones where you uh, have a product that is a tangible product that has an inventory. And so, those sectors, uh, in principle, can run down their inventories uh, while they're uh, on lockdown and then rebuild their inventory. So, that kind of looks a little bit more like a V-shaped recovery. On the other hand, the so-called play sectors, uh, these are the consumer discretionary sectors. Of course, the people who work in those sectors definitely are working, uh, but we call them the play sectors because they are choice. These are choice. Um, you can choose to go to a restaurant or entertainment or travel. And what we have found, of course, is that these sectors, um, one, they, are, they are not storable. The activities are not storable. They are services, they're hotel rooms, whatever, uh, airplane flights. And so for companies in those sectors, it is absolutely an L-shaped recovery. Um, what was lost in the early part of this year will never be recovered from the standpoint of revenues for a country, uh, for a company. It's also never recoverable for a country as well. Now, when we made when we made this sort of um, alphabet of recovery, the V for manufacturing and the L much more for consumer discretionary, um, what we have found actually, of course, is is that um, the manufacturing is not nearly as much of a V shape as it seems because supply chains are disrupted, uh, not just because of some geopolitical reasons and, and nationalistic reasons in, in the healthcare and, and PPE space, but more generally, um, if one factory is closed and your supply chain partner uh, is open, you're still, you still have a problem. Uh, and so the manufacturing has also been very definitively affected uh, and the recovery is taking much longer than many people thought. Um, the consumer discretionary sector has, uh, faces uh, two headwinds. One, of course, is the fear uh, of a resurgence. And, and unfortunately, it's really uh, very unfortunately, we are seeing some resurgence of, of those um, virus cases. And so there's a consumer fear. And so businesses' response to consumer fear with regard to slowing down a production line, having fewer people in a restaurant, uh, masks on an airplane, all of these things are businesses responding to consumer concerns. And of course, in that environment, business investment is not as strong and business employment is not as strong. And so we are very concerned about this uh, um, pace of return uh, of the consumer especially in the consumer discretionary space. You put that all together and you look at a very long delay in achieving a pre-COVID level of GDP. We do not see that happening until later on in 2021. Um, you know, some countries maybe sooner, uh, but there's a very long tail in the global economy of countries that are not expected to achieve the pre-COVID level of GDP, even into the end of 2021 and into 2022. So this is not a, a picture of a, re a recovery um, that, that is uh, satisfactory in, in any way, shape, and form. And of course, this is even given the really substantial and, and we would argue appropriate um, uh, fiscal response and monetary policy response. There's more that needs to be done. Um, we have some more time when we ought to be thinking about fiscal choices because as, as uh, 
Professor Bishop said, um, there's a lot of debt. So we have to be thinking about fiscal choices and monetary policy choices that will bolster the supply side of the economy, the productivity growth in the economy, because that is going to be essential going forward as a way to repay these obligations that economies are taking on. Some are in more difficult cases than others. Uh, the tourism dependent economies are the ones we worry about the most. Uh, the manufacturing economies are rebounding a little bit more quickly, especially if they are technology oriented. But even those economies ultimately are going to be a hostage to a less robust global economy. So we really need to be thinking about those fiscal and monetary policy actions going forward to set the stage for a more robust uh, recovery um, and one that has strong productivity growth, an essential ingredient. Thank you. So I'll now turn to Yu Ping. Yu Ping is coming uh, to us from Hong Kong. So can you just uh, give us a sense of what your experience of COVID-19 has been? Oh, of course. Um, I'm at the moment in uh, Hong Kong, but I am normally based in uh, Beijing. I came back on the Chinese New Year's Day to celebrate uh, the Chinese New Year, but I've been stuck here ever since. Um, that's my life in Hong Kong is actually not difficult because I live on an island, so I go out hiking every day, which I never would be able to do uh, in my normal life. But Beijing, um, it was quite difficult for quite a while. I mean, I came back late January. My original expectation when this whole thing started was that I probably should be able to go back within one to two months. And now it will be very soon for five months, and I still am not sure if I would be able to go back. There's discussion if we might be able to restart the new semester in uh, September on time. So it's quite difficult. For quite a while, it looks like things are becoming controlled in, uh, um, in, in March, from March. But now it looks like uh, um, there's new cases and economic activities become a lot more uncertain. So I think one thing I just like to say, compared to my previous experience at that time in 2003, when I was in Hong Kong, we had a SARS. Um, and that was a very brief. It was sharp a decline, but it was a very brief. And once economic activities recover, we had like a V-shaped recovery. I don't think that this time we will repeat the same, same uh, uh, drama. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, we have a lot of students who went back to China for Chinese New Year and haven't been able to come back to Australia as well, so we know what you're going through. Um, so unless the vaccine for COVID-19 is found soon, um, the structure of the global economy is likely to change permanently, uh, particularly considering our use of technology, international trade and supply chains, and China yeah. is a huge part of, of that transformation. So what trends do you see emerging in the Chinese economy that you think will be permanent? Well, I think the change already started, the, import, the rising importance of the digital economy. In fact, I just mentioned the SaaS in 2003. Um, the, um, the Alibaba's um, Taobao, um, Timo, was actually launched the month after the end of SaaS in 2003. And now today, um, in fact, the e-commerce already accounted for 30% of the total retail sales. So that's already becoming a big part of the story. Um, but it actually was quite useful during um, this pandemic. I mean, as Catherine mentioned earlier, uh, businesses were responding to uh, the changing environment. Um, I saw the digital economy, online activities, and so on. In fact, it became an important macroeconomic stabilizer. Um, I mentioned that I was in, I, I've been in Hong Kong for the whole five months, but I actually taught a course during the last the semester and I just submitted the final result last uh, week. So activities continue. In fact, in some areas, it became even more dynamic. So my expectation is that China will probably continue um, in that direction. Number one, because we're talking about this so-called the fourth industrial revolution, which will probably push the application of the big data, um, uh, AI, and so on, even in a more significant way. The second is because of the pandemic, people now actually appreciate more these contactless um, uh, transactions. 
Number three is, well, the government now is thinking about the need to further stimulate the economy. And they're thinking in, to invest more in the so-called new, new infrastructure. New infrastructure is more related to um, the IT sector, the big data, um, the cloud computing, and so on. Um, and, uh, and, and, and so with all these factors, I do expect the, the Chinese economy will move in that direction with a much, much more prominent role of um, the digital, tech, digital economy in the, in the whole economy. So do you think these, these trends will be a catalyst of gro like significant growth in China? And, and do you think that these emerging trends might spill over to other countries? And to be well, I, I think this is a very big thing for China in the next phase. You are seeing basically almost everywhere um, things are trying to be digitalized, um, whether it's in terms of manufacturing activities, the service sector, but also finance. So with um, the government and the private sector joining forces, making a lot more investment and probably encouraged by this, what is happening at the moment. So I do think this will be coming a new theme of the Chinese economy. How much that will, will stimulate um, the global economy with the spillovers? I think it really depends on what happens in the aftermath of the pandemic. For instance, um, the global trade regimes, the investment uh, arrangement and so on. But definitely, if China is going to invest more demand for more technology, there will be a lot more demand and interactions with the rest of the world. I'm sure there will be more demand for Australian commodities. It's good to hear. <laughs> okay, so um, I'll now turn uh, to, to Phil Lu. So the last few months must have been a tough period of time for policymakers like yourself. So thank you for leading us through these tough times. Um, so the tandem health and economic crises have been accompanied by massive uncertainty. But we started in a good position relative to other countries in terms of having more fiscal capacity than most countries, a history of su sustained growth and a population, at least up until now, have followed the distancing restrictions. But if we compare ourselves to um, where we were before the global, global financial crisis, we were in a similar strong position. Obviously, it's a different type of crisis, but um, we know that international policy coordination was important during that crisis. So I'd be interested to know how and to what extent the RBA is working with central banks from other economies. And how do you compare the situation working with other central banks now to the last crisis? Good morning and uh, thank you, Renee. You're right, Australia was in a much better position going into this crisis than many other countries. It reflects a long history of uh, responsible fiscal policy, very sound institutional arrangements and a strong banking system. In terms of the cooperation between the central banks, it's uh, been deep and wide ranging. The main form of cooperation though is information sharing and comparing notes. The central bank governors have been meeting regularly through video conferences, most of them organised by the BIS. Our staff are talking all the time and I'm chair of the Committee of the Global Financial System and we've been having regular catch-ups. In March and April, we were talking about the extreme volatility in our markets and worryingly the dislocation in government bond markets which were affecting the risk for a yield curve everywhere around the world. And then our discussions turned to the really terrible consequences for the labour market, for people, of the, of the virus and the economic downturn and how we should respond in terms of policy. So those discussions have been really helpful for me in framing our own policy response. The one area where there's been explicit policy coordination is the provision of a US dollar swap line. The same thing occurred in the global financial crisis. There's, in some parts of the world, there was a shortage of US dollars, so the Federal Reserve set up a facility to supply US dollars into different parts of the world. So we've been um, uh, having these regular auctions of US dollars in Australia, as many other countries have had, that the US dollars ultimately supplied by the Federal Reserve. But in Australia, there's been very little take up of these US dollars because Australian banks have uh, little demand for US dollars at the moment. So but the main form of coordination really is information sharing. We're all responding to the common shock and it's good to be able to compare notes. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. I might now turn back to Catherine. Um, so in April, the US unemployment rate reached 14.7% and 6.65 million people filed for unemployment. So in comparison, only 665,000 people filed for unemployment in the Great Recession. 
The Atlanta Fed's measure of GDP now suggests output growth of minus 48.5% on an annualized basis. And on Monday of last week, the Federal Reserve announced that it would purchase debt issued by corporations to support market liquidity and, and credit, given the high stress in financial markets. However, the stock market has recovered by 45% since it's lower in March. So given the devastating numbers in the real economy and these extreme policy measures, how can a disconnect between uh, financial markets and the macro economy um, be explained? And will the devastation that we're seeing in the macro economy eventually show up in financial markets? Your microphone's not on, Catherine. You're, you're right. Um, you're, you're absolutely right, Renee. There is a, there is really quite a striking disconnect between um, the measures in the financial markets and the measures of the real economy. Um, I note that even amongst my uh, financial market colleagues, uh, they too are, are very concerned um, about this disconnect. Um, they're very worried um, that uh, there's going to be a, uh, a comeuppance uh, for, for financial markets, and not just the equity markets. Um, we see it in the spreads in the investment grade space, we also see it in the high yield space. So um, there's been uh, quite a bit of narrowing um, on the expectation um, that uh, either the economy is going to perform much better than uh, most of us expect, or uh, um, that there is a, a permanent backstop um, from the Federal Reserve. I think it's important though to step back just a little bit to the time when the, this very significant market dislocation happened um, on March 23rd. And at that time, the Federal Reserve was faced with, uh, and actually the fiscal authorities as well, with a tremendous um, uh, 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 up, upheaval in, in the financial markets. And it was 100% it was appropriate at that time for the, for the Federal Reserve to, to pull out um, a real range of policies that they had and, and programs that they had uh, originally um, come to put together in, in the context of the global financial crisis. It was critical at that moment because we were already in the, in the throes of um, the COVID crisis and the potential at that moment was for a gl another <clears throat> global financial crisis to, to evolve uh, on top of a, a, a disease crisis, a virus crisis. So it was absolutely appropriate at that time to come forward with the programs that they put into place. Now, you know, time has passed and those programs have been uh, very successful. Perhaps just announcements alone uh, had a major effect on the economy, but it was also backed up by the fiscal. If we go back to the timeline, it wasn't the Fed alone, it was also the fiscal uh, authorities and the very robust programs that they put into place. But you know, time has passed. And um, as I, as I uh, noted before, um, we, we need to, even though the, the, the virus is not behind us yet, uh, we, do, we do worry about the second waves, we have to, as policymakers, we have to be looking forward. And we have to be looking um, not to exit, I mean, that's, that's way too uh, early a word to be, to be considering, but we have to be looking at what are we putting into place in order to create an environment going forward where um, there is productivity enhancing growth to be supportive of the debt burdens that, that are being taken on appropriately, appropriately taken on. Now you have to look forward to how are we going to repay it. That also has a policy element to it that is critically uh, important. And I might argue that Europe with uh, its focus on the pan-European recovery fund, the emphasis on the digital and climate, that does create an environment where business investment has to step up because digital and climate require new investment, new ideas and innovation. Uh, we don't see that yet in the United States. Um, some discussion of infrastructure projects, but you know that's that's kind of a limited. So I think it's an important distinction between the U.S. and Europe when we think about on the fiscal side, on the monetary policy side. You know, I think the issue here is that um, the financial markets are, get very comfortable with with a backstop. They get very comfortable with the Fed having and having the tools to 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 narrow the spreads uh, kind of indiscriminately. Um, everybody's you know on on the high yield market in particular, all all the spreads are narrow. Uh, some of them should be wider than they currently are, um, and the equity markets too are. You could say, well, they're looking forward to next year when everything will be better again, but you can say. You know, no, actually, it's not better next year. It's only as good as it was mm. last year. And that's really not good enough for an awful lot of people. And it shouldn't be good enough for the equity markets to be performing the way they have. 
Um, you Ping, I'll now turn to you. Um, the behaviour of business and consumers has changed in terms of how payments are made and received as a result of COVID-19. Some merchants prefer contactless forms of payments and are refusing to accept cash for health reasons. And meanwhile, consumers have moved to online shopping where there is no facility to use cash to purchase goods. So as director of the Inst Institute of Digital Finance, do you think that the accelerated move towards a digital economy will be a permanent change? Well, um, certainly I think, uh, I mean, China actually is leading in terms of mobile payment. Um, and we have two largest uh, mobile payment service providers like uh, WeChat Pay and Alipay. Both of them, each of them actually have something like around 1 billion active users on each of their systems. So it's been quite extensively used. And nowadays, you know, people like me going out I um, normally wouldn't really carry any cash in my wallet. So a mobile phone would really be sufficient. And that's actually, actually quite extensively um, used. The biggest thing and the most important contribution really is to extend the financial services to people that otherwise would never be covered by the traditional financial services. So for instance, people in the remote areas, in the Western region and so on. And as I said, when more than 1 billion people using the mobile phone, this is really a big, big advancement um, and going forward. The second thing, um, what, what uh, um, these uh, uh, mobile payment services providers did was they also trying to cover these uh, businesses, so-called offline businesses. There is one thing I'm not sure if your audience is familiar with this uh, payment techniques. There's a so-called quick response code. Um, there is this is a one special note that you can print on the paper and then you put it on your store and the people can come in just to pay use their mobile payment. Rolling out these quick payment code, the QR codes, um, to the out to the off, offline um, the street side stores, you including all these businesses into your system. We we had a recent account and it's roughly they are close to. 100 million stores, small businesses, what do we call them? Offline small businesses, um, they're already a part, as a part of these, um, the mobile payment services. So that is really playing a very big role. Um, so I'm not sure if this is going to become a new trend. It's already here. It's already covered almost 100% of these offline businesses. But the, the, the last, the, the, the final uh, big change, and I think we start to become a lot more appreciative, is that even during this pandemic period, you're able to extend the loans to these businesses that still require some financial assistance because most of the bank branches actually shut down because of the um, the lockdown and the social distance policies and so on. But these online banks, these new banks, we have three um, new internet banks uh, called MyBank, WeBank, XW Bank. They continue to extend a lot of loans for a couple of reasons. Number one, because you do have a big tech platform in which, as I said, each of them already has something like one billion active customers. So customer acquisition is no longer an issue. And in fact, because of the long tail uh, feature, marginal cost of servicing additional customers is a very, very low. That's the first thing. You already have all these tech customers at the doorstep of your bank, the virtual bank. The second thing they did was use big data analysis and trying to do credit risk assessment, because usually the banks will only be able to manage the risks by looking at your financial history or look oh. at your operational assets. But now you can look at actually your digital footprint and using um, the so-called machine learning models. We just completed a joint study with IMF economists, which will be out as a working paper, just to show this FinTech approach for credit risk assessment actually works better than um, the traditional approach, both because of the information advantage and because of the modeling advantage. The third thing is because you, once you have a big tech platform, you can actually monitor the whole process of the, from the loan application to lending. And in fact, the Alibaba's, um, the, the, the MyBank, 
they have this so-called 310 model, which basically means a potential customer can apply for a loan, filling in the form online within three minutes. If the loan is approved, the money is in your account within one second. And the number three, there's a zero human intervention in the whole process. So that kind of new technology really is changing the life and changing the financial industry in China. My bank alone at the moment already serves like more than 20 million customers um, the extending loans every year. So that is, I think, is, is not just a, a new trend. It's a, it's a revolution, especially for financial inclusion. Great, thank you. So we might now turn back to Phil. Um, so now that the Fed is purchasing corporate bonds to stimulate the US economy, how effective can monetary policy in Australia be going forward, given that US intervention in financial markets will have large effects on international capital flows and will likely appreciate the Australian dollar? Will this new monetary regime in the US reduce your capacity to conduct monetary policy independently of foreign central banks? I think the answer to that, Rene, is no, it won't. I don't see any loss of monetary independence here. If we still have the ability to choose the monetary policy measures that are needed for Australia. We've seen recently we introduced a form of yield curve control and we have a term funding facility for the bank system. And in the US, you've seen extraordinary interventions in capital markets because capital markets are very important for you in the, in the United States. So we can still choose the measures that are suitable for our own needs. In terms of the exchange rate, we do know that when a country eases monetary policy, exchange rate ex it tends to depreciate. So if everyone eases and we don't, we'd expect the dollar, to, dollar A to appreciate. Now, at some point, it's true that could become a problem, but I don't think we've reached that point yet. I would like a lower currency in terms of macroeconomic outcomes. It would help reduce unemployment and lift inflation closer to target. But at the moment, I think it's really hard to argue that the Australian dollar is overvalued. We need to remember that exchange rates are relative prices. And the health outcomes in Australia have been relatively good. And the economic outcomes so far have been relatively good. And I think the future is relatively good compared to many other countries as well. And commodity prices have held up. So it's not surprising to me that the Australian dollar is where it is. I'd like a lower one because it I'd like uh, lower unemployment and slightly higher inflation. But I'm not worried about a loss of monetary independence here. I think we can still choose the measures that are needed for our own economy. Thank you. Do you think that now would be a good time to visit the monetary policy framework for Australia, given the substantial and seemingly permanent changes that we're seeing in the um, conduct of monetary policy internationally? I don't think it's the right time now to change the monetary policy framework. The one we've had for 30 years is served us very well, but as um, things develop over the next coming few years, it might be worth looking at it again. At a very high level though, and I think this is important, the objectives of the RBA are set out in legislation that was passed by the Parliament way back in 1959. And those objectives are price stability, full employment, and the promotion of economic welfare of the people of Australia. In my view, those objectives have stood the test of time. They're the right objectives for a central bank. And at a very high level, they continue to guide our policy. Over the past 30 years, we've thought the best way to pursue those objectives was a to have a flexible, medium-term inflation target. And that served us really well. In time, it might be worth looking at whether there are other ways to achieve those very high-level objectives that are set out in legislation. At least though at the moment, my view is that it's not clear that there's a better framework than the one we have. But it's worth continuing um, to look at ideas. Whatever framework we have, though, I think it's likely we're going to see, see interest rates at their current level for years. So it could change the framework, but I don't think it's going to change the outlook for um, interest rates over the next few years, given the deflationary forces in the world economy, the large output gaps that exist, mm -hmm. uh, the savings investment dynamics right around the world. I think we're going to have low interest rates for a long period of time, whatever framework we have. Thank you.
Thank you. So we have a question uh, from the audience. So Warwick McKibben, would you please like to turn on your video? So as Catherine said, we're, we're nowhere near the end of this uh, pandemic. And what we are likely to see uh, further waves until there's a vaccine. Um, my concern, though, is a lot of policies around the world, particularly the fiscal positions of governments, have been predicated on coming to an end very soon. It seems to me that by creating this enormous uncertainty with a fiscal cliffs, uh, in Australia's case in September, um, do you think that's such a good idea and that we should be actually doing whatever it takes to keep the world economy functioning? Uh, and secondly, um, part of the problem I understand is the very large build-up of government debt. Um, is this a problem when we have negative real interest rates to the extent we have? And should we, more, should we be more creative with the way we finance some of these interventions? For example, income contingent loans or revenue contingent loans for small businesses could be a way in which the fiscal position doesn't actually get impacted if in fact those companies and those individuals whose incomes return to more normal levels actually get to repay the loans. Thank you. We would like to address those questions. Um, well, I can, th that last point, I think, uh, you know, um, hi, Warwick, it's been so long time we haven't seen each other. And, uh, anyway, uh, too bad that we're not in, in, in Australia at this very moment. But uh, so, you know, there are different ways. So I think two points, one that I already made, which is that um, we really have to be looking forward uh, to be um, more creative, more, more thinking about how do the policies that we put into place now um, uh, support productivity enhancing growth going forward. Uh, that I think is critical and as I say some some economies uh, policymakers are addressing that uh, to a greater degree than others. Now uh, the creativity part I think um, we have seen some creativity in some countries with regard to the use of a guarantee instead of um, a straight straight spending. Um, so there, you know, in Europe in particular um, and not all the countries within Europe have been able to do that um, but but there have been um, much more uh, deployment of a guarantee function, and that is not exactly an income contingent loan, but it does serve a bit of a function because it, it basically means that the government stands behind the um, activities and the loans, um, and uh, it, 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 the, the guarantee is only called if the overall climate deteriorates uh, to the point where the where the businesses um, cannot function, which of course in the context of Germany would also impact the banks uh, negatively. So that is a that is an important sort of uh, creative strategy, uh, which um, does not use the fiscal instrument um, as you know, as a, as a bunt tool, a tax and spend, but more as a guarantee. And then there could be more room for that sort of thing, in, in my view. Uh, it does have impacts on the financial markets. You can't get away from that. Um, but, um, but, you know, it, 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 it is assuming that you can get um, your, that your policies as a, as a, as a whole will, will move the economy onto a more robust uh, growth path. Uh, and so you, your guarantees serve that purpose and they do not get called. Renee, um, Philip here, can I come in? And Warwick asked whether we should be doing whatever it takes, and I think that's the answer to that for me is yes. I've seen what we've been doing is building a bridge to when we get to the other side once the virus has passed, because at some point it will pass. And to build that bridge, we need to, to uh, throw everything at it, both on the fiscal and monetary front. I think it's been an entirely appropriate thing to do. Uh, when we get to the other side, though, once we built the bridge and we get to the other side and the recovery is taking place, I think we do face a world where there'll be a shadow from the virus for quite a few years, people will be more risk averse, they won't want to borrow, in Australia we're going to have lower population dynamics. So unless we change something, we're going to have a world of slower growth in Australia. And if that's the world we're in, we can't resolve that problem by just continuing to borrow borrow to build the bridge, but we can't borrow to address a slower growth world. But what we can do mm -hmm. is reform. And the list of areas where we should be doing reforms are well known. They include tax, infrastructure, human capital, industrial relations, regulation, entrepreneurship and R&D. If we don't address those areas, then I think we will just meander along with kind of mediocre growth and we can't borrow a way out of that but we can borrow to make investments in these areas to lift our potential growth rate back up to where it was before. I think it's the right thing to borrow now to build the bridge and it'll be the right thing to borrow to make investments in our future. 
Um, we did have another question from um, the audience, uh, but I seem to have lost my Q and A's. Okay, but I have plenty of questions of my own until that comes back up. Um, so I might uh, turn to Phil. So a recent report from Deutsche Bank shows that low interest rates and leverage in the corporate sector have created an environment for zombie firms as unproductive firms can remain alive, preventing investment and employment in more productive firms. So this will ultimately lower growth in the economy. So you're now conducting unconventional monetary policy and interest rates are incredibly low. How can Australia avoid developing a zombie economy being in an ultra low interest rate environment? I don't think we've got a zombie economy. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not really w worried that there are a whole bunch of zombies around in the Australian economy that are consuming financial resources and workers and, and uh, fit the scarce physical assets, preventing the successful dynamic companies from, from, um, from growing. I think that's not the world we're in. There's a lot of spare capacity. Okay. Firms with good ideas can attract financial capital. They can attract resources and they can attract workers so I don't think it's right to blame the bomb the zombies but I do think there is a more general issue here which is actually more important and that is a lack of economic dynamism in Australia and I've been concerned about this for some years and I'm even more concerned about it now before the uh, virus hit we saw slow rates of business formation we saw low rates of job switching and we saw reduced uh, research and, and uh, development expenditure in Australia. So they're all signs that we're not as dynamic as we used to be. Now, I don't think you can blame zombie firms for that. It comes to things that are deeper. The society's attitudes to risk taking, the nature and extent of regulation, our tendency to regulate whenever we see a problem, the incentives we set up in the tax system for entrepreneurship and the arrangements for research and development and uh, for failing firms exiting the market. So they're the things that are making us less dynamic. So I'm not blaming the zombie firms that are surviving at the moment. Remember, those zombie firms, if they exist, are employing people, which is good, and there's plenty of capacity for, for strong firms to grow. It's these deeper things that worry me, and they, they, they go to the society's attitudes to risk and entrepreneurship. That's the thing we should be focusing on. So I have a question um, from Paul Lindwell, which is, what are the implications if there is a permanent systemic increase in risk aversion as a result of COVID-19? Would these reduce innovation, lower productivity, et cetera? And is there li likely to be anything that can usefully address this? I'm not sure who that is directed to, but who would like to try to answer that one? I think Governor Lowe just basically gave the answer to that one. <laughs> I mean, I think there will be a kind of a, a, a protracted period where people are more risk averse, and that means they're going to be less likely to spend and firms are going to be less likely to invest. So do we just accept that? I hope the answer is no. I think governments and business can re-energise the entrepreneurial spirit and make investments that uh, leverage off the fantastic technology that's around in the world. We're all finding new ways of using this technology. I think that's going to have a, a long benefit over time. But a comprehensive reform agenda by governments backed by business, I think will make a difference and re-energize the sense of optimism that people have about the future. If we don't do that, I think we're just going to meander along, being slightly risk averse, low growth, low growth in wages, Asset price is not moving very, very far, and just a, a general sense of um, malaise. But that's not inevitable. We have one, um, one other live question by Daniel Moss. Daniel, could you please um, turn on your camera and mic? Phil, notwithstanding your comments about the framework, I'd like to ask that from a broader perspective. Uh, when central bankers have talked uh, since the on onset of COVID, the first thing they address and the thing they address most articulately is the prospect of long-term scarring in the labour market and the very high rates of unemployment. Now, most central banks have some sort of text in their mandates about full employment, yet rarely, if at all, is this a numeric employment or unemployment target similar to the 
that figures in a lot of inflation targets. Is it time or is one consequence of this era a move to a numeric, easily identifiable labour market type of target of some kind? I don't think it makes sense to have a target for the unemployment rate in the same way we've had a target for the inflation rate. Uh, we're seeing at the moment kind of how the unemployment rate can be a misleading indicator of what's going on in the labour market. With this big decline in employment, many people have left the labour force, so uh, the unemployment rate has not risen um, that much. So there's, the labour market is much richer than... We need much, many more sources of information than just the unemployment rate. Uh, over recent years, we focused a lot on underemployment as well, so uh, people who have part-time jobs who want more hours, um, that's a form of underemployment. Uh, we, don't, we just don't know what constitutes full employment in terms of an unemployment rate. So I think it'd be low to kind of commit to a specific number. The general point, though, and the legislators back in 1959 knew this, we should be seeking to get to full employment. However we define that in terms of unemployment, underemployment, hours worked. That's the right objective to have to be at full employment. I don't think we get much from putting a specific number for the unemployment rate on that. Yeah, so we have I just, just if I can intervene, I mean, uh, to answer, uh, you know, from the experience of the United States, um, it, we had an ex the United States has it had an extended period of time where the unemployment rate kept falling well below what anybody would have thought was the you know, non-inflationary, uh, non-accelerating inflation rate of unemployment, the so-called NERU. And if there had been a, a explicit target um, of unemployment at NERU, which people thought of was maybe 5%, maybe 4.5% or so, um, then the, you know, the last period of time where more and more people were brought into the labor market, including people who had left the labor force, um, those people ha would, not have become un would not have become employed. Um, the Federal Reserve would have tightened sooner um, and uh, would, have miss would have gotten further and further away from the inflation objective. Um, and so I think the challenge uh, is uh, when there's multiple objectives, and, and you know, not all central banks do have more, have dual dual mandates. Um, I mean, I think the challenge here is that that you you don't want to move further away from one objective uh, because you've met some one of the targets. When in fact, as as Governor Lowe says, there are um, there are extended uncertainties about um, getting to the Nehru. It's it's not a magic number. And uh, you know you would hate to be in an environment where where you where you where you tightened monetary policy too soon and left people out of participating in the labor market, and that's what you would worry about the most um, in in the context of the target. So we we only have a few minutes left, so I just want to finish up by asking you all uh, the same question uh, about your own economies. And um, that is, do you have a positive vision of what your economy will look like as we emerge from the COVID-19 pandemic? And what is your vision? So maybe we'll start with um, Catherine. Uh, well, my positive vision is one that we do have more entrepreneurship. We do have more risk taking. We do have more innovation. We have more productivity growth. It's a vision of the United States that is comfortable, again, um, engaging in the global economy with its allies uh, to make differences in the way globalization uh, takes place, uh, both on the global scale, but also has a domestic policy framework that uh, recognizes that not everybody has been able to enjoy the fruits of either the globalization that we did have or the financial um, benefits that some people have. So there's a lot of inequality in the United States. Um, we've seen it play out particularly um, in the last uh, few, few weeks um, with Black Lives Matter. Um, and before that, over the decade with, with uh, the, the, the manufacturing, um, erosion and so forth. So that is a domestic policy problem, but you cannot do d effective domestic policy in an environment of retreat from globalization uh, and retreat from technological innovation. So you need those two pillars, technological innovation and deeper global en engagement uh, in order to make good 
on the commitments that you've made to your citizens, uh, all of your citizens. That's my vision. Yeah. You can. Well, um, there are two things that I feel quite optimistic about the Chinese economy uh, coming out of the pandemic. The first thing is the digital economy I already mentioned. It's already like widespread uh, application in the Chinese economy. Now with increased enthusiasm of the government and the private sector making more investment and pushing ahead in this area, I think that's a one bright spot uh, for the Chinese economy. The second area I think I'm paying a lot of attention to is the consumer market. I mean, we like to say the Chinese economy, uh, which was growing at above 9% on average during the last four decades, it was mainly driven by number one exports and a number one, number two investment. That is probably somehow is going to change now, given the pandemic, but also other global environment and so on. And I think consumer market is going to become a lot more important. Sometimes I say, well, maybe we could say during the last 40 years, China created the two global story, economic stories. The first story was exports of labor-intensive manufacturing products. There was a one time you go out and it's very difficult to find something that was labor-intensive, cheap, but not made in China. That time is gone now. Then we had a second global story, buying a lot of commodities, including commodities from China. These are still ongoing, but I think gradually will give way to the consumer story. Um, China's retail sales will probably be the largest this year, um, exceeding that of the U.S. But we continue to see rise of consumer spending going forward, even if economic growth slows in the coming years, because number one, the saving rate of the household probably will gradually edge down. But at the same time, household income as a share of national income is rising. So overall, I see this as the most dynamic story. And I think it could actually be the next global story that China would be able to contribute to the, to the world economy. And that has something to do with the so-called shifting of the supply chain. There was one story I just saw a survey by Japanese manufacturers in China looking at where they're selling the products. Most of the Japanese companies actually sell eight, more than 80% of their products in the domestic market. So there was a question when you want to consider to relocate away from the Chinese market, where is your, closest, where is your, your consume, consumer? That's something I think will be very interesting to watch. Great, thank you. Phil? Thanks, Renee. Uh, I too remain fundamentally optimistic about the future. Australia has a fantastic set of underlying fundamentals and once the virus is contained and uh, we find uh, antivirals or a vaccine, those fundamentals can reassert themselves. Just recently we've got on top of the health crisis better than many other countries. Our political system has responded in the way we would have hoped it would have and the economic downturn in Australia has not as been as severe as others, and it's not as severe as we expected. Three or four months ago, I thought that hours worked in Australia could fall close to 20%. I think the number is now likely to be close to 10%, so it's not nearly as bad as uh, we had anticipated. Having said that, I think there is going to be a shadow from this crisis that's going to last for perhaps years. I talked about the reasons for that previously. We can move out of that shadow slowly or we can move out of it quickly. I think the two things that will help us move out of the, that uh, shadow are further advances in technology. And it may be now we're going into an accelerated period of technological progress as people uh, leverage off the new ways of working, it's possible. Uh, the other thing that will help us is policy reform. And I talked about the areas uh, previously that would help here. And I've been encouraged recently that the government has moved in a number of these areas. It's talked about industrial relations, it's talked about infrastructure, and it's talked about the need to reduce regulation. I think if we can make progress in those areas, then Australia can, again, look forward to strong and sustainable growth and rising living standards for all Australians. I fear if we don't leverage the advances in technology 
and we don't see policy reform, we'll just go on and meander and kind of have slow growth and slow growth in incomes. But it's not inevitable and we have the capacity to return to strong growth. And the response that we've seen in the past three or four months gives me confidence that we can leverage off those opportunities we have. And Australia has done remarkably well over the past few months relative to many other countries, both on the health front, the political cohesion and the economic front. And that should give us all confidence that we can meet the challenges of tomorrow as well. Thank you. Great, thank you. So we've come to the end of our time. It's been a pleasure to spend the last hour with our panellists and our Zoom audience. I especially thank our speakers and attendees who are not necessarily in a convenient time zone for staying connected with us. So usually this will be the time that we give our panellists a round of applause. And although we can't hear you, the world needs good karma. So please give our speakers a round of applause at home. Thank you.